So, uh, so it's my my uh, honor actually to welcome everyone today um, to the second installment of the sessions on territory, which this spring addresses the notion of materials, urbanism as material accumulation. And as you remember, the program. This time is exceptionally co-curated and organized between the two schools, ETH Zurich and Harvard Graduate School of Design. A very warm thank you to my co-curators, assistant professor at the GSD, Dr. Charlotte Malterbart and Hans Hortig, uh, doctoral researchers at the ETH. Thank you so much for such a great uh, collaboration uh, over a few months in preparing this program. And I'm not uh, sure, I don't know the names, but I would certainly welcome the GSD students. I expect that a few of them are with us today. It is uh, fantastic and a great honor to have the students of the two schools, GSD and ETH, in the same auditorium. And then a very warm welcome uh, to our guest speaker today, Professor Carola Hein of the TU Delft and Niraj Patia of California College of the Arts, who joins as respondent. Uh, it's a great uh, honor and uh, uh, a kind of a highly resonant uh, uh, duo, and they will be introduced in the moment. We look very much forward. So just a few notes in the beginning. The theme in focus of our program is the future of urbanism, or let's say the meta team. <laughs> and uh, we've, uh, we're concerned with this uh, question since uh, four years, actually, when we started working on this program uh, back then with Professor Mark Angelil. And we asked ourselves is, if urbanism should, should keep its relevance in the future as part of architects' education and as a practice, what should be its main characteristics. Under the term urbanism, we understood a range of related fields, a wide uh, kind of interdisciplinary space spanning urban and landscape design, uh, urban and territorial research, and a range of other special practices, including activism and the arts. We also understood urbanism in an extended sense is a broadening of our disciplinary perspectives from cities to territories and even to the planet as a whole. And in the previous five iterations of this program, we debated politics and practice of urbanism under neoliberal conditions. Then we began to trace new ecological contours of urbanism in the era of the Anthropocene and also we scrutinize the forces of technology beyond technofix in the production of urban space and landscape. We've had amazing guests and some incredibly exciting discussions. The entire archive is online, I'm proud to say it, so please enjoy it when, when you have the time. And this spring we are back in the sixth iteration of the program to consider the future of urbanism in relations to materials, material flows, and material accumulations. With our five speakers, Joshua Komarov, who began two weeks ago, this afternoon, Carola Hein, and in the coming weeks, Sarah Nichols, Jane May Hutton, and Anna Tsing, and other guests, we will be exploring material cultures of architecture and urbanism and spatial practices and politics of material use from the territories of resource extraction to the construction sites and to the spaces of everyday life. So should we and how reimagine these material cultures and practices through the agency of design? Thank you very much everyone for joining us this afternoon and uh, I would kindly uh, pass to Hans, who will be introducing our uh, guests, Carola Hein and Niraj Batia. Yes, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I am uh, introducing, uh, after the lecture by Joshua Komarov that we had last week about the general theory of islands, we welcome today uh, Carola Hein. Um, Carola is a professor of history of architecture and urban planning at the Delft University of Technology. 
She, she has published widely in the field of architecture, urban planning history, and has tied historical anal analysis to contemporary development. Among other major grants, she received the Guggenheim Fellowship to uh, pursue research on the global architecture of oil and an Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship to investigate, investigate large scale um, uh, urban transformations in Hamburg between 1842 and 2008. Uh, her current research interest includes the transition of architectural and urban ideas foc focusing specifically on port cities and the global architecture of oil. She has uh, curated the exhibition Oil Dam Rotterdam in the Oil Era 1862 to 2016 at the Museum Rotterdam. Um, and among her edited and co-edited books, I'll mention uh, the recently published um, uh, mono, uh, book called Urbanization of the Sea um, and the edited volume um, Adaptive Strategies for Water Heritage both uh, highly recommended and also uh, open access um, books. So uh, find them on the internet. <laughs> and uh, also she has published, um, the, for example, the book Port Cities, Dynamic Landscapes and Global Networks. Uh, as a respondent today, we welcome uh, Naresh uh, Bhatia. He's a licensed architect and urban designer um, whose work resides at the intersection of politics, infrastructure, and urbanism. He's an associate professor at the Californian College of the Arts, where he is the director of the Urban Research Lab called Urban Works Agency. Uh, Niraj uh, has also held teaching positions previously at the UC Berkeley, at the UT Arlington, Cornell University, Rice University, and the University of Toronto. He is the founder of the Open Workshop, a trans design research office examining the negotiation between architecture and its territorial environment. Um, he is co-editor of uh, several issues of the Bracket um, magazine and uh, also uh, editor of the book, The Petropolis of Tomorrow, including uh, an article by Carola Heim. Uh, Niraj has a master degree in architecture and urbanism from MIT and the Bachelor of Environmental Studies and the Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Waterloo. Um, I'm very excited about the lecture and um, look forward. Um, please go ahead, Carola. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks a lot for the introduction and thanks everybody to be for being here even uh, during your break time, as I just learned. Uh, it's always good to hear why are you maybe listening in and to try to, to pitch it to that. Um, so my understanding is that you're looking at different materials, their impact on the built environment, and you're then also trying to understand how this can be used for design. And that may be one more element that I would like to add on to the introduction. So I'm in the chair history of architecture and urban planning, but the way that I look at history is from a long-term perspective. So to understand the past through a new lens, I argue will help us to better uh, design the future. So that's what I would like to take you along with. So the idea is if we put on our oil lens or our oil glasses, that we will actually be able to design in a different fashion, look at your designs in a different way. And that for me also involves looking at it from a multi-scalar perspective. So tying the building to planetary urbanization, to the urbanization of the entire globe, and to look at different types of stakeholders. So let me first try to bring you to the topic. So what do I mean with the petroleum scape and, and, and why does it matter? Well, first of all, the entire world is linked through global flows of oil, and they actually float primarily on water. So in the end, I want to come back to this whole notion of the, uh, of, of the role of port cities in these flows. So on the one hand, is this map shows you the global flows of oil. Again, they're on water, so they correspond to maritime flows, but they also correspond financial flows. 
So basically it means that the highways in the US, since we have a Californian here on the screen, um, fund what's going on in the Middle East. And so rather than reading architecture purely as a local or even a national device or a national identity, I think we also have to consider them as part of global flows and to consider the economic power that lies in them and that goes way beyond national boundaries. Now, by saying this, I'm basically picking up on a caricature from 1904, which I think is still highly relevant today. Mm -hmm. So this caricature picks up or uh, exemplifies standard oils on all kinds of industries, the, in, the steel industry, the capital, the White House, and so on and so forth. So we see that the impact of oil hasn't changed much in the last 100, almost 120 years by now. So this grip on oil, and this is what I've been trying to, to conceptualize with the idea of the petroleum scape, is not one that is only in the industrial spaces. So that's what maybe comes to our mind, the petroleum tanks, the refineries, the pipelines, but it goes way further. And each part of this whole spatial dimension is linked to other individual human experiences. So there's few people who will ever have access to the, um, to the industrial parts of the petroleum scape. And if I were in the big classroom, I'll ask you to put up your hand if you've ever been visiting an, a refinery. So maybe I'll ask those that I can see who has visited a refinery. And the answer is probably, yes, Milica has, okay? So she's one of the few because you really can't get in and maybe we'll come back to that in the discussion. But if I turned it around and said, well, who has visited a gas station? Well, all of you have, I don't even have to ask that. And in my courses, I often ask my students to make mental maps. How do you get from your home to the university? And at least in the US when I did it, everyone had a gas station in their, uh, in their ma mental maps, turn right at the gas station. They become so much of a mental marker that people even tend to get disoriented when their national colors are no longer visible. A Mexican visiting The Hague told me once, I'm sort of missing my gas station colors when I'm walking through the Netherlands. So the gas station may be kind of the handshake between the physicality of oil and the, and the consumer, but there's also the financial dimension of it, the administration. So the big headquarters that are also part of this whole oil business, and they're not located in the same places as the heavy industry is, for example. And then yet the oil dimension gets more and more um, difficult to trace. So we have quite a bit of oil funded structures and that can be anything from a street to a, to a bridge to a railway, but also housing or a movie theater or a hospital. And that depends very much on the country where the oil architecture is in. Now I've also sorted out infrastructure because it has a different um, dimension. It's, it's important in terms of being publicly funded but co-used by the petroleum industry. And we should not forget that asphalt is actually a petroleum product. Now for the architects among you, this next dimension of the, um, the plastics in the, build, in the building is very important. And you could take it over to textiles, but I've been trying to concentrate on the build environment part of it. But if I told you to drop your oil, well, most of us would probably be leaving our phones and our glasses and our earphones and our wet clothes. Well, you have to strip quite a bit in order to drop your oil. And then there's a whole dimension that of philanthropy where oil is written into the built environment, but not um, used as an oil product, but rather as one promoting the, uh, the private investor that is behind it. So Rockefeller is a great example there. Now, this scheme gives you an idea of what I want to be talking about in terms of the breadth of the oil spaces. And keep in mind that these are not one single place. They are really a network that is positioned in an entire region. Um, and this entire network is represented in all kinds of literature, art, films, uh, brochures from different perspectives. And that's what I try to indicate here through these arrows. So 
corporate media will showcase often the gas stations, often the headquarters, will showcase even nature and all the benefits that oil brings. But much more rarely does it showcase industrial development, or at least that depends on cultural context and time. So while in the America or in, in, in Europe, industrial achievements, refineries might have been shown uh, 100 years back or maybe even still 70 years back, that has very much disappeared and refineries have been debranded. On the other hand, in Iran, for example, refineries still are featured on the, on the money or in textbooks in China, you will have still refineries being um, displayed as a, as a benefit to the country. So the use, the, the, the way that we see space in corporate media is very different from their physical occupation of space. And the same thing is true for popular media and even architects play a big role in that. So the way that architects pick up on the petroleum scape helps shape people's perception. And that's also my call to you here to really think about how you see petroleum and what you then do with it in your, in your design. Uh, artists have a play a, a, pop, a role in there and in popular culture, we also see quite a bit of different interpretations of oil spaces and how people are being led into it. So based on this, I would like to give you a bit more visuals on what I actually mean with all of this. So this could be an oil scape, a petroleum scape from the 1870s. This is the Schuylkill refinery. The Schuylkill is a river near Philadelphia or now in Philadelphia. Uh, and this Atlantic refinery was bought up by Standard Oil in the 1870s and developed into something much bigger. Now at the time they had figured out that oil was uh, a nuisance in city centers. They used to have storage tanks in the open and that caused a lot of fires uh, and had well a lot of uh, safety risks associated with it. So they built a new storage and refinery site outside Philadelphia and you literally have on the maps Apple Yard refinery Apple Yard. Now this site continued to develop and just remember the nice bright blue river uh, and the nice greenery around. So at the time, these refineries needed rivers. And so a little bit uh, above this, the refinery that I just showed you was the Belmont refinery. And this was also on the Schuylkill River so that they used the water for heating the petroleum, separating the different types of petroleum, uh, and then also use the river for shipping the petroleum. So you have a close association between oil and water between, uh, and that's why port cities also play an important role in it. On the land side, you have rail infrastructure. And at this time, this was a refinery in the 1860s, you still had horses and stables and barrel makers and so on. Now, this is actually one of the few refineries that didn't last very long. Uh, and that was because it was located above the water intake of the city of Philadelphia. And you see that in many cities that those that that was a risk that was too great to take so you didn't want to pollute the drinking water of the entire city but once refineries had been established they usually were there to stay so here we see the the belmont refinery which disappeared parks oil works disappeared and down here all of these refineries would then gather um, into a big into a bigger cluster now this bigger cluster was served by oil from Western Pennsylvania. And that's where one of the first oil booms had happened around cities like Titusville, cities that are really no longer on the map that have sometimes completely disappeared, leaving just some green fields. So extracting oil can be beneficial in the first run, but not in the long term. What was beneficial though, was the development of infrastructures. And this is, and this is where um, our friend Rockefeller comes into play. Rockefeller, the founder of Standard Oil, today's ExxonMobil, didn't become so big because he owned oil or because he found oil, but because he transported and transformed oil. So he 
owned many of the, uh, the um, railways that were necessary to get the oil to the East Coast and thus to the consumers and to the transportation and transformation sites. And he owned the refineries. Now, this is the same site that I mentioned just before on the Schuylkill. Remember the nice blue waters and the greenery? Well, over 170 years, this has turned into a huge petroleum site, which only closed last year. And for the longest time, it was the longest still running refinery. And in the background, you see uh, Philadelphia. Now, the investment in all of these oil structures was so important that it was really very difficult to shut this whole thing down. On the one hand, you have extremely polluted land. That's something that architects will have to be dealing with. How do we clean up this land? How do we make sure that we have strategies in place and not only for those sites that are so close to cities that they're actually valuable enough to make large investments. But often these sites don't get closed because they're too difficult to clean up or because it's easier. And in this case, uh, they brought oil from the Dakotas to the center of Philadelphia and they kept the refineries running. So it's easier to transport all of this oil through the entire country, creating all kinds of security risks, bringing it into a major metropolis, then closing down the site and, um, well, uh, and, and, and cleaning it up. Actually, the citizens also at that point were opposed to closing it down in the fear of using jobs. So it's a very complex, uh, complex problem. Now, these kinds of sites exist all around the world, and you've probably seen them driving on a highway, even if you haven't visited them. So this is the, this is the oil refinery and uh, oil site in, in Rotterdam, and the port of Rotterdam is about three quarters used for and by petroleum. Now, these are huge sites, but they're really not accessible, and that is very much in contrast to gas stations. Now, the oil ports were the first sites where from the 1860s on oil entered, for example, from the United States to Europe. But it was that was in the beginning was about lighting oil. It would take until the end of the 19th century for the car to develop and to use petroleum as a fuel. And with that development, petroleum started to spread into the landscape. So the construction of highways, also meant that you had to set up tanking gas stations. So places where you could refuel. In the beginning, like you see here, these were kind of mom and pop shops without a very specific architecture. You would recognize it through the oil pumps that you can see here. Sometimes these oil pumps would be standing next to restaurants. There's a photo from uh, the Netherlands where you have tables set up for people to eat and the, um, the gas station right next to them. It would take until the 1970s for this to change. The oil companies realized that they had all this branding power off a gas station, and they came up with this idea of clippable boards so that even whatever the gas station looked like, they could like clip on these boards with their company colors and thus become uh, recogniz recognizable. Hello? Anyone Somebody's unmuted. Please mute yourself. Oh, okay. Thank you. Go on, Carol. Yeah, sorry. Uh, and so the other part of this, so the, the gas stations are these kind of small flimsy sites, often for modernist architects to pick up and design with. On the other hand, and particularly for architects, this is interesting, the more conservative architects, often the one who had already made major designs for the colonies, who were involved in building national identities, those were the ones who were called upon to design the big headquarters and research centers. And these buildings have become icons of their city. So in, in New York City, this building on, on Broadway, the standard oil building on Broadway, is something that could be seen from the port. And that became the identity of Exxon, of standard oil at the time. And similarly, buildings in, in, in London or in The Hague had this kind of power. So for example, here, the ex former Exxon building, now is the Spaces building in The Hague, is typical for Dutch architecture with its red brick Amsterdam school type of design and the Shell headquarters is sitting just behind. Now, the infrastructure real transformation that I mentioned before can happen 
at a global scale. And so I think it's really important to think about these oil flows as something beyond the national scope. Even though nations are involved in it, it becomes very important in colonial um, exchange. But the oil companies like Exxon or Shell, even though they're involved with nations, often operate at a multinational, at an international scale. I think they're really a very good explication, explanation, demonstration of planetary mm -hmm. organization. So the contemporary Shell um, company, Royal Dutch Shell, I should say, Royal Dutch is the Dutch part of it, um, extracting oil from the Dutch colonies, so from Indonesia. And Shell was originally a transport company based in, uh, in, the, in England. Together, they, as they, they merged, but the importance of the Shell part of this deal was this ship here, the SS Murex, which was the first tanker ship to cross the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal was built before, uh, it facilitated transport between Europe and Asia because it shortened the travel time so you didn't have to go all the way around Africa. But it was forbidden for sail ships carrying oil barrels. So only once oil was put in a bulk into this ship, so in a tanker ship with a double hull, that's the first ship that was then allowed to, to, to cross the Suez Canal. And with this decision, Shell also invested heavily in Suez, in Egypt, uh, in all kinds of structures. So building at what was then the biggest refinery in Suez, for example. And the history of oil is really full of all these, the biggest refinery, the biggest refinery uh, throughout time. Now, what is also quite fascinating about oil is that they always adapt to new uses. And oil in comparison, say to coal, <clears throat> can be transformed into very different things. So you, we have fuel for airplanes, we have gasoline for cars, we have diesel, but we also have asphalt. And asphalt is often, or uh, bitumen is often a problem because it's not something you really easily can sell. But the, the oil companies have employed chemists to find new ways to use it. And one of them is in the case of the Shell company in Egypt uh, to build a street through the desert, the King Fuad way, and using some of the bitumen to pave that street. So in that sense, the streets themselves are a physical artifact of oil due to the bitumen on them. Uh, when, you, when we go further and we look at how the companies actually shaped the built environment, this is a, a map made by, by Rose, Sarkosh, one of my PhD students, it shows you that if the oil is in a place that's in hospital, difficult to reach, all companies will actually invest in creating infrastructure, streets, pipelines, and ultimately even building entire cities. So Abadan, for example, is a city built by BP as a model of the garden city idea. So it's also a transport of urban planning ideas, and you have everything uh, located around the refinery from the housing for the workers, workers housing for the expatriates, uh, daycare, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So all the functions of a city are located in vicinity of the refinery and are a reason for it being there. So they are really seen as something positive, positive. And we will see it until probably the 1970s that living just next to a refinery was never really seen as an environmental threat or a problem. Now, I mentioned before that the oil industry was very smart in promoting its products. So from lighting oil, and you actually you could have said lighting oil should have stopped um, when electricity came around, but it didn't. The car and, and oil was used, started to be used as a fuel. Now, during World War II, um, a lot of industries went into plastic because plastic was a lightweight material that could easily be used for warfare. Now, after the war, these new companies and these new materials existed and they were looking for places to use them. And one way to do it was architecture. So we have a collaboration of MIT, um, Disneyland uh, and the petroleum industry to look into how plastic could become a a material for architecture. 
and the plastic house in Disneyland is an outcome of that. So millions of people were shown a new way of living uh, with a very classical gender oriented and family style actually, two parents, two kids, uh, the housewife in the kitchen, but they also already had, um, they featured already new machines like something like a microwave and so on and so forth. So future style of living was advertised through the plastic house in Florida via plastics. This doesn't, didn't come to play, but still our houses are full of plastic. So rather than architects designing a single house of plastic, we have houses where all the building elements are made out of plastic one by one. Plastic windows, plastic in the floors, plastic in the paint, and you name it. So in that sense, the, the plastic industry and the oil industry has really taken off in the post-war. Now the question, what, what does this ever for um, philanthropy is an important one. And actually this chart already sort of talks to it. So we see here the development of the Standard Oil Corporation in 1911, a big breakup when Standard Oil was split up because of having a monopoly which actually today many of these com companies have come back together, but also here the philanthropies. And when you look and when you talk with researchers or people uh, uh, who know about the, the history of these, they will often say, well, the company Standard Oil is very different from the family, the Rockefellers. The Rockefellers are good people uh, making the best for their country. And I think that's something I do want to raise as a question also put to you. So in particular, this through this case, so this is uh, Williamsburg. Some of you may or may not have been there, but it's an important place in the US where you have, it's one of the few places where you have electricity lines underground and where there's no cars and where you can walk around. I think I actually like the place. It's a little bit, it's, uh, you have plenty of enactors there telling you how the, city looked at the time, but it's well done. And they have carefully re rebuilt the architecture in this capital. Jefferson gave a, a, an important speech. And uh, here you have the old governor's building when it was still part of, the, of England. So in that sense, it's a, it's a very important and it's really a national site for the United States. Now this site was rebuilt with Rockefeller help, Rockefeller Jr. And so you can celebrate it as really a pure philanthropical engagement. And that's something I would at least like to question a bit. So for example, the, the hotel in the area has often been used for by the Rockefellers to meet with dignitaries and um, business partners, say from Latin America, to make oil deals. Uh, and on the other hand, there are plenty of newspaper articles where a member of the Rockefeller family is shown in a horse-drawn carriage in Williamsburg uh, with the Emperor of Japan, with the Queen of England. So in some ways, what is really a national icon becomes a publicity tool for a particular family who also happens to own a house uh, in this place. Now, if we look at these representations then and the way uh, oil is being commodified, this is one of the paintings that I really think is, 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 is really relevant to that idea. Um, it's a painting of Dunkirk and you see this is from the 1920s, how much the oil industry is celebrated. So these gleaming white uh, oil tanks are really about the future of the city. There is something positive. There is something to be celebrated. And Dunkirk actually sets up a little um, housing district right next to the refineries, similar to what happened in, um, in Abadan. And throughout Europe at the time of paper maps, you see this kind of celebration. The Netherlands is all about tulips and little cute houses and windmills. And that is what the oil industry will sell you as the benefit of using oil. Architects pick up on it. We all know the Corbusier and the Plan Voisin, but we might less be aware of that, Le Vo Le, that Voisin was a car maker. And you could interpret this very much as an celebration of petroleum. Similarly, similarly Frank Lloyd Wright um, and Broadacre City is a plan that only works with individual traffic. And as long as we don't have these cute little flying icons that he draws, we are very much dependent uh, on cars and the suburbanization in the United States 
is certainly an outcome of it. But perhaps the most fascinating of all of this is the city of tomorrow, in which started with an ad advertisement from Shell. So Shell had designed this city of the future with skyscrapers and highways, which was or had had it had a design, which then became part of uh, General Motors exhibit in 1939, which then became the, the foundation for post-war reconstruction. So we have a collaboration here of the car industry, the oil industry and design, which really, or urbanism, which really promotes the use of oil. And you could then think further about designs such as these or, or paintings such as these celebrating oil, Edward Hopper, Usha. And for some of you, at least, uh, you may still already have played with these kinds of uh, plastic toys. And Lego has famously long been a an oil product for plastics, uh, and then put together into gas stations, for example, some of which even featured the iconic logos, not only gas, but even Esso, Shell, and whatever oil company was behind it. So this raises an important question for us. How do we deal with this heritage? How do we deal it through heritage sites, like this museum in Wietze, for example, and how do we deal with it as architects? So BP Bridge in Chicago by Frank Gehry is a pedestrian bridge, but what do we want to, what story do we want to tell about BP British Petroleum or beyond petroleum as they have tried to rebrand themselves? So the point here is that these industry infrastructure are the huge spatial elements of the petroleum scape. All of these other parts are relatively small, but what we see is much more the retail or the administration, which is then celebrated. Um, so let me, if I have enough time and you let me, I wanted to show you a bit more about the mapping part of it, which is also what I think Milica is looking at or where she's doing great work in, let me put it this way. Yeah, absolutely. So there is a talk at all, don't worry. <laughs> okay. Thanks. So the uh, I was going to show you Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Antwerp, so the area where I am in currently. And for most of you who have traveled here, have seen tulips and biking and uh, little cute houses. And you have probably less seen that this is the second biggest petroleum hub after Houston. So how did it become that petroleum hub? Um, is quite interesting to think about. And so we've been looking at mapping, and I think this shows you potentially also the power of mapping as a research tool. At least that's what I would like you to get out of it. So the first oil from the United States arrives in Rotterdam. This is uh, Rotterdam is here in gray, the port is in black, and the oil is in, in red. Uh, so it arrives here in 1862 on a sailboat. Now, very quickly, like in Philadelphia, they realized they shouldn't put oil above the water intake of the city. And so they start uh, expanding the oil ports out to the west. Now, this new canal piece is built here, which will allow the big ships to enter. And that has been a key part of uh, development for the port of Rotterdam. Now, you see by the 1930s, so cars are only just starting to emerge in the Netherlands a whole new oil port is being built, the Walhafen. And the Walhafen is really fascinating because it actually has an airplane landing site so that the decision makers from Shell, from the uh, English part, can also get directly to the port. And then even though it's the war, we see a very quick development of petroleum to the West, 1950s, 1960s. And this is a key moment because deco decolonization around the world. So refineries, particularly the ones by Shell were nationalized. The one in, in, in Suez, for example, and um, Abadan is nationalized, the one from BP. So Europe realizes it needs, uh, it needs its own uh, energy security. It needs its own refineries. So the port of Rotterdam develops into this petroleum hub and it serves particularly the, the German hinterland. So the big industrial areas of Germany are served through the port of Rotterdam. There had been some debates whether they would go through the north of Germany, Exxon was for that, but in the end Shell won. There's a beautiful dissertation on that. And 
they put all of these uh, refineries here. And it's also an intriguing story about um, national interests. So the port of Antwerp, which is close by also um, now is served through the port of Rotterdam. And simply because the river that serves the port of Antwerp passes through the Netherlands for a small piece. And the Netherlands did not allow the Belgians to dredge that river. So at some point, the river was too shallow for the big ships. So that's why the big ships have to go to Rotterdam and then pump the oil to Belgium, to Antwerp, via pipelines. And that's how the port looks today. And you can understand then what the problem of the energy transition is. So there's so much petroleum in the port of Rotterdam, which serves Germany and Belgium, that it's not easy to say, well, let's just uh, turn it all off and replace it with other functions. So that requires very careful transition thinking. Now, we've also made these maps in a different way at a bigger scale, including the capital of The Hague here, uh, to show the different layers of the petroleum scape. So on the one hand, we see that Rotterdam has all the industrial elements already in 1910, but at this time, the headquarters are already in a different city. So even in the time of lighting oil, did the oil companies ask to be located right next to the ministries? And this difference between two cities is starting to become even more visible in later years. So by 1940, uh, you see, for example, if you can on your small screens, see some of these little orange dots. Now, these are gas stations. And I'm not guaranteeing every dot, but we went through the archives. These are the gas stations we found for 1940. So there may be more or less. But what this seems to indicate is that there were way more gas stations in The Hague than there were in Rotterdam, even though the petroleum itself was mostly located in Rotterdam. So the assumption is that there are social justice issues. So the rich people were in The Hague. They were the ones who owned the first cars. They were the ones working in the ministries, whereas the people in Rotterdam um, didn't have the same access to cars. And so the way in which petroleum then spreads through the landscape is also something that we can observe through the maps. And that's why I'm saying mapping itself is research. So by 1970, the city of Delft, where my university is, is one where a lot of gas stations are. And there are actually several professors at the time built new types of gas stations. There was a gas station on campus. But when you look at the uh, landscape, there were much less. So people would have to drive into the cities to actually get petroleum. It's only in the following years that the countryside gets more and more gas stations and that goes hand in hand with the construction of highways, uh, which were then paired with um, gas stations. Now, we've been trying to get this together into a more um, architectural story. So pairing buildings with these various developments, buildings and urban plants. Now, what I would like you to think about is then in terms of visualization, what do we actually see? And what does this, um, how does this change our petroleum mindset, our cultural mindset? And this is a, 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 a young uh, um, a woman who made this after having read my texts and she transformed this famous painting of the milkmaid into the oil maid because it kind of gives you a new view on what the, the lands are actually about and what's happening there. So as architects and designers, you have this power of visualization. And this image captures the imaginary of people and turns their ideas around uh, in terms of what, how does, this, how does this influence our design thinking? So that's what I've been looking at with, with students and then I've used it as the foundation for, for design studios in, in Dunkirk, in, in Naples, Rotterdam, um, for example. And now we're working on, on, on Beirut also. But the idea is how do we, if we look at the narratives of oil, what do we see and how can we translate this in new stories beyond oil? So in the case of Dunkirk, for example, students, uh, each student had a different design and we put them in the end together in a kind of master plan. So there were projects from 
algae growth in the port to um, uh, mycelium or bamboo or uh, food generation on trains. And the point of departure here was the fact that the refineries in Rotterdam, uh, in Dunkirk, sorry, had already closed and that we had to, and, uh, so the, the region is actually trying to rearrange the whole economic ecosystem because once the refinery closes, all kinds of other industries also uh, disappear. Now, this um, approach here then generated other ideas and some of the students picked it up in a much more visionary manner. So uh, Ege Kacir here, for example, was looking at um, these, these uh, wind-driven objects that roam the beaches of the Netherlands. So, they, so he was thinking of something similar to clean up the soil and constantly generate new, um, well, to, to plant new seeds and to revitalize the land. So what they all tried to do was to look at transition strategies, how to come up with a plan for until 2080 to redesign areas. Another one, and I think I've mostly the, the visionary ones here, um, another one, but that's more a dystopian view by Rashid Ayubi. Uh, he wrote a story, an alternative history um, where people are mostly living of gaming and the gaming industry is fed by um, windmills but the, he called it the last drop of oil. The closed refinery became a really a treasure chest for medicinal purposes and others. So things that we really need the oil industry for. Uh, and then the whole historic buildings of Dunkirk was set on top of this refinery. People were shopping directly from the container ships. So it was also a story about how we should and could rethink the ports, which is the other part that I'm really interested in. Um, so that's also, and I'm just sending you there if you're interested, we have this the Port City Futures Initiative, because I think all of these um, movements that we see in oil are actually grounded and anchored in maritime flows and particularly in port cities. So that's where I started with by saying that these maritime flows cross the world, they are part of planetary urbanization, and the key hubs for these are the petroleum, um, are the port cities. So in some ways, uh, you can always say oil and water don't link, don't mix. But I would say that in port city regions, that's exactly what they do. And, port, and oil has really promoted ports to their important status today. So let me stop there and we can go back if you want to hear more about port and city and mapping. So I left that part out, but I don't wonder, I think it's good to have more discussion now. Thank you so much, Carola. It was uh, wonderful and uh, really powerful. And uh, um, just as you said, so the, the, the milkmaid is a petroleum maid and, and Homo sapiens is a, is a Homo petroleum, I guess. And you make it so, so clear that, that it's really, um, um, you know, fascinating. I, I uh, uh, and I, I hope it underlines the the, the urgency. And uh, I just want to 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 tell you that uh, Niraj also joins us in a moment. So what we what we normally do as hosts, we we ask, let's say, our questions <laughs> to open the discussion, then we, we give the floor to our respondent and finally to the students. So this is the, the kind of flow Great. of conversation. And uh, so uh, I, uh, I'm i really eager to ask you, Carola, you spoke about, I, I mean, I just want to say, I. I, I uh, today I first time understood that you are also professor of history because I, I always saw you as a, as an urban designer, but now I really understood how deeply this historical perspective is is important, and I, I also really appreciate it, and I think it's extremely powerful, you know, how how you uh, to say so weave and, and unpack these uh, 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 you know these investigations so. Uh, what I what I would like to to ask, because no doubt I mean you introduced your your lecture with the with the statement which was uh, about basically the the 
importance of historical method in you know informing let's say our practice and our uh, to say so ideas for the future right and you spoke about uh, uh, transition strategies no and then in the uh, energy transition strategies in uh, you know port uh, cities and and these uh, to say so massive infrastructural sites be that the port of rotterdam or the the, the standard oil or other places and I'm curious, uh, I mean, you know, the students, of course, we will always have wonderful ideas, right? And I, I am curious what you found out uh, in terms of transition strategies by the, by the companies themselves, no? By the oil <laughs> majors and by, by the governments, right? So let's say if we look at the port of Rotterdam in a, in a progressive country such as the Netherlands, you know where where is where are the processes heading what 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 do you think will happen in the next you know 10 20 30 years that's a, it's a huge question um let me give it i, I just see julia Scotto on the screen too so julia uh, not, nobody has their visuals turned on, so I don't know. If ah, yes, please. I have forgotten to say that. I would kindly ask everybody who who would who is uh, you know who feels like it. Let's make this a kind of embodied discussion. Turn on your cameras. It would be a great pleasure to to see everyone, and we see a lot of friends and collaborators today in the audience. Yeah, and I'm saying that because we have a book coming out on oil spaces. It's just been sent off to Rutledge. So hopefully it'll be there this year, where Julia also has a great article in. Uh, and there we're trying to bring it back together hist histories from around the, all of the world uh, that are related to oil and space. So nice to see you, Julia. Uh, but <laughs> let me try to answer your question first. I think it's, so what about transition strategies of ports, cities, and so on. What has fascinated me of, by, in, in Dunkirk is the fact that the oil first disappeared and then the strategy came. And, in the, and I think that's what's happening in many places. So the port of Rotterdam, sure, is one of the leaders of the World Port Sustainability Partnership and so on. Um, but you also see much bigger forces at play. So the Klingendal Institute made a research on the closure of refineries. So many of the, something like two thirds of the Northwest European refineries were closed. But the ones in, in Rotterdam and in Antwerp will be among the last men standing refineries, in quotation marks because they are either too advanced, uh, strategically located, or they have all kinds of other benefits. So it often is not even a local decision to close. That's what I'm trying to say. It's a decision from a much higher point of view, from global flows that will determine whether or not something closes. And it's probably often beyond the power of national decision-making and even sometimes the power of, of European decision-making, or at least they would not want to engage with it. And sometimes and that I had not understood that before, even the oil companies in this meeting of the Klingendale uh, Institute, you see that the oil companies are looking for clear policies. If Europe were to say, we only allow this, they would be able to switch, but it still means that the rest of the world works differently. And so you see a lot of, Greenfield refineries emerging, a huge refinery in Saudi Arabia to serve the Chinese plastic market. So how, what player at what scale is able to influence that? And that's really the question of, the, of planetary urbanization. It's not a, a Rotterdam port that will be able to make that kind of a decision or only to a certain degree. You can bring in the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative um, to see how much a port or a port city can actually handle. What happens if a port says we no longer transport petroleum? If Rotterdam said we don't no longer handle petroleum, well, Belgium and Germany would be hit and they might not accept it if they are not away from it. So this whole discussion of who are the stakeholders at what level could we actually make change? And for the architecture students, one more sentence here. For the architecture students, I think it's important to realize you can't say, 
okay, let's just close the port of Rotterdam. That will just not work. Or let's just put housing in these areas. They are way too polluted. So we need, I think, architects and planners to think critically what is a port, what does a port, what can this transition be about, and then help develop strategies for green energy where we might need double the land size that we have now and not try to squeeze ports out. To, so to find more value in the port rather than just replacing it. Not sure that if that answers your question, but it's yeah. an attempt. No, it, uh, it does, it does. I mean, it's uh, it's interesting how you describe the, the kind of positions of oil majors who, you know, who have in fact a kind of a planetary reach, but in fact, in different regions, they will operate differently, you know, so let's say with one hand, they will, you know, they will continue to, to build petroleum infrastructures while, you know, developing green energy in other places. So, so in fact, a kind of a, a kind of a, uh, um, you know, governance ultimately is the, the question and how we align the interests, uh, you know, in, in different, in different, uh, countries and in different parts of the world. Um, yeah, and, and maybe one more thought. If you think about the iPhone or any any uh, yeah. phone, uh, it has changed our lifestyles globally. It has changed everything from energy to infrastructure. Exactly. That's the kind of lifestyle change we need to live more sustainably. Uh, so what I'm yeah. trying to say in my courses on, on, on building green we used to be green by need. We didn't have a choice. We took the stones from next door because we couldn't carry them. Now, for some time, we've tried to be green by desire. So if you can, you just lose, lose, use less, but that doesn't take you very far. So how can we be green by design in the way that a simple, well, simple single tool made us change all of our habits and allow things like the Zoom connections that we have right now? Thank you, Carol. I think this is already, um, you know, taking us into into uh, let's say new territories of conversation in in terms of how we can integrate this uh, into our own practices. Um, I would I would like to to ask you, and maybe this is something that could also loop back afterwards to Niraj's approach. Um, but um, I think that there is a there is a question of uh, uh, you know you mentioned how there were some reactions from companies when they were uh, forced back in the in the 60s or in the 50s to basically reinvent um, their infrastructure or or uh, you know change strategies because of uh, uh, independence of countries and uh, you know basically the, the kind of uh, uh, need to to uh, to change uh, aspects. I think we all know that the kind of uh, current forms of extraction uh, that are uh, practiced by all these companies are basically neo-colonial in nature. And um, I'm, I'm curious on whether you have um, thought about, or maybe this is something that, that could be discussed further, um, the role of uh, resistance in this um, uh, new ways of perceiving this extraction. I think that uh, when we talk about being less bad, uh, it, it's for me uh, really missing the point uh, in the sense that we know that uh, oil is also, uh, you know, responsible for so much suffering uh, and, and really hardcore um, necropolitics even. Um, and and uh, there, there are many black scholars that are working on that. I'm thinking about Imani Jackson Brown and Black Ecologies where she discussed, uh, you know, landscape of exploitation and the, the harm done to black bodies uh, in, in, um, in uh, you know, in, in American uh, extra, ex extractive, uh, practices and I wonder how we basically loop that and I, and I also want to echo somehow this image that many of us probably still have in mind of this um, uh, black rock pipeline uh, uh, you know uh, resistance movement which was led by uh, indigenous and 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 you know uh, native people who were really uh, at the forefront because their own uh, kind of cultures was basically being destroyed by our exploitative processes. Um, how do you actually factor that question in uh, looking at the way that architecture is basically uh, complicit in so many ways uh, 
in, in using materials that are, you know, made purely of, of uh, plastic and things like that, and how uh, we, can, we can factor that into our design strategies. Um, so a big, big question. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post the, the link to Imani Jackson's Brown work so that uh, the audience also um, may be uh, familiarized. And I know that it, it might also um, uh, be something that Niraj could, could also jump into later on. And I've also put a couple links in the chat, um, also about the, the, the Port City Futures little videos that we've made, including on the Walhafen and the petroleum scape therein. Um, but the question, I'd like to turn your question around a bit. I think it's really great, all the work that anthropologists and all these, all other social scientists and humanities do to identify it. And I'm sure, or I think that rather mm -hmm. than technology leading, it should be humanities, social sciences leading. Where do we want to go? What are our, what's our life goal? And then adjust the technologies to suit it. Um, but what I'm trying to discuss with my students is start with the words. We either talk about gentrification or we talk about urban renewal. But in the end, we're talking about the same thing. So in some ways, how could we make the humanities and social sciences contribute, help with the changes, rather than being primarily critical, uh, a, a critical way of accompanying processes? So how can we put the social sciences and the humanities back into the lead so that people don't just have to protest, but that they already think it as a system before so that we don't only have to react to it. And I, so that is something that I would really like to see happening. Uh, and it, I mean, it, it's let me go back to the point of history. Often I heard from historians saying, oh, I can only deal with things up to 10 years back. Uh, then I have to stop because then it's no longer history, right? But I, I think more about it as a, a way of education when we started this lecture, it was already, history. we've already been through history in that sense. So, and future design is also about reimagining. I mean, we've we had so many future designs. So it is important to be critical, but how can we make these critical approaches and this critical understanding part of our design or of our thinking about the future? And, or to turn it around, how can we make architecture schools uh, or architecture students into critical thinkers. And I think in order to do that, we may need, I don't know what your respective experience is, but we may need to give more room to the social sciences, to the humanities as part of the design process. I'm, I'm up curious for, to hear you. All up for curriculum uh, revolution, you, 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 uh, you of course, uh, caress me in the right direction, but... Um, yeah, no, I don't want to monopolize the conversation. Melissa, you, you, you maybe wanted to react to that or, or maybe uh, Hans, uh, I don't want to, to kind of. No, no, I think we will, we will, uh, we will return to those questions. I mean, uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's interesting, you know, that this, uh, perhaps this kind of energy transition is, is the, the single most important design question that, <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> we have and, and still, in a way, we, we don't know exactly how to go about it, right? And I, I think that that uh, not only in architecture schools, but I, I think uh, you know more basically in in a, in a wider field, right? So uh, I think that uh, that um, uh, you know how how exactly to 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 capture the right knowledge and the right tools and techniques and to say so to bring them in the in the uh, in architectural education is uh, is extremely urgent no so uh, um uh would uh, would would uh, niraj like to join us right now sure uh thank you well Carol, thank you so much for the talk, as well as um, Hans provided me an article in advance. So I, I had some cheat sheets into your talk. <laughs> and um, I'm always so impressed with your ability to take 
an amazingly complex um, and broad issue and distill it and uh, present it back to us in ways that we can see new connections. Um, there's, there's a part in the article I was provided and you brought it up a little bit in your talk about path dependency. And it seemed like this was something that really um, is at odds with transitioning. And, and it seemed like the two main things in path dependency were the permanence of the infrastructures laid down for oil, as well as the, the sheer expense, which you know made us just kind of come back to these, um, these infrastructures and, and keep finding new ways to use them. Um, and those, these ideas of permanence and just sheer capital investment seem at odds with what we know right now in the world we live in, which is much more a world that is contingent and indeterminate and where we don't see huge capital um, investment. At least I'm, maybe I'm coming from the American context. We can't even build a high-speed rail line here. There's like very little investment in kind of large scale uh, capital projects. And so I'm just curious, as we transition to different energy regimes, um, how we might leverage path dependency, because it doesn't seem like path dependency itself is an issue. It's maybe just the path we're on is the issue that we're the path that we're currently dependent on is the issue. Um, are there ways that we might be able to leverage concepts of path dependency for alternative uh, energy regimes? Well, or are we leveraged by it? I would almost say. Um, the, so what I didn't show you this, but we've been mapping also green energy in the wake of the petroleum energy. So for the same region mm. and uh, we haven't completely finished it yet, but I would say that the, the social patterns that we've seen in the past. So who benefits as this, where the rich people live, you might get the gas stations earlier, but you might also get the electric cars earlier. So I, what I'm trying to say is that you probably see continuities where you would not like to see them or where you have legal uh, provisions on to drill for petroleum that now influence how you can go into uh, geothermal. Uh, hmm. But let me just, just back up for a second. So I think this whole idea of path dependence coming out of the political science is that institutions have developed patterns over time that keep on repeating. And one article that struck me uh, at the time, I don't remember the, neither the title or the author right now, but uh, more or less the content, that the regions, the Baltic states, which had transitioned from Soviet Union to uh, independence to EU partnership. So you would expect huge changes to happen. And often, even though these huge global changes happened, the local institutions kept on largely behaving the same way, very roughly said. So on the one hand, the point is about identifying what these partnerships are, how they tend to behave, and then ideally being able to say, if we were able to change this, or how could we use this permanence in order to benefit the energy transition? And I think that, so what, understanding both what hinders us, so what keeps us continuing the energy dependency on oil that we have, be it through legal patterns, be it through institutional patterns and so on, and to see can any of these collaborations help us actually engage the energy transition in a smart way. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been trying to map, this is more about port and city relationships, but the same concept of past dependence in there, so Hamburg, in Hamburg, port and city have always kind of supported each other and existed in this, coexist in the same space. Very different from Rotterdam, where the port has always been in the lead. Or from London, where the city is so back, the port has run away and left the city basically behind. And those patterns keep on repeating. So if we could activate these patterns in a smart way to understand where opportunities are, maybe then we can get this past dependence to work in our favor. Otherwise it risks stopping us more than anything else. That, that said, and I, you know, one thing that came up in your article, which I thought was very powerful was just the range of skill that oil has uh, entangled our lives. And, you know, you re reference a lot of the everyday, you know, quality of that. And I'm just curious, you know, for, and, and maybe I should just put out there, you know, my bias, <laughs> even with my questions, is coming at this as a designer, as someone kind of thinking about, you know, what are we going to do in the future? So I'm always looking to instrumentalize 
this type of research into ways that we might uh, work as designers, which I know is controversial for a lot of historians to use history only as a mechanism to instrumentalize it uh, somehow. So I'll put out my own biases uh, first, uh, but I am curious in the kind of multi-scalar mapping of the petroleum scape, if you if you've identified or see certain levers um, or certain scales that might be more most impactful uh, at these questions of transition. Hmm. I wish I had a clear answer to that. I mean, right now in my courses, I mostly try to train the designers to ask questions. So every time the next sustainable building, sustainable material, sustainable city plan comes along, to ask what is actually sustainable about it, environmentally sustainable, socially sustainable, culturally sustainable. And therewith kind of put the burden back onto the designer to say, how deep can you go in your questions? So if you build the smart house that consumes, that allows you to put your windows up and down and open and close, whatever, well, you're producing, you're, you're feeding the next data center and you're actually not mm -hmm. necessarily being sustainable and you get the people to run to the gym or to drive to the gym in the worst case, uh, rather than opening and closing your windows yourself, right? So that step of getting it into the minds of the people and then thinking about, uh, and, and I'm trying to give you an answer here, maybe accepting what is built as the foundation for what we should be working with. So rather than going greenfield, but to pay way more attention to the built environment, to the existing structures, and the implications thereof. And, and let me give you one more example where we might think much deeper than we often do. So energy or water saving, there's all kinds of water saving devices in our houses and everybody's proud to use less water, right? Now, the problem, I heard this in Germany, the public water system was built for um, a certain through flow. So whatever the private households save, the public, the municipality has to flush through the system to clean the system. So in the end, you're not effectively saving water. You're just shifting the, the funds from the private citizen to the public system, citizen. Something similar came also up in discussions on New York. So it's, I think it's a systemic problem. And it's the same thing when you say, okay, let's all build tiny houses. Yes, but who is going to fund the kindergartens, the daycares and so on? So I don't have an, an answer for you, but very carefully looking at what's there, how it works, and then thinking about how can we build on it rather than replacing it necessarily. So in some ways, it's a plea for history at the same time. I, I'm, I'm surprised by your answer about, you know, building on what's there, because on, on one hand, um, I think your research really shows how much uh, the form of the city and architecture has been complicit in naturalizing uh, these oil into every aspect of our lives in ways that we can no longer even uh, perceive it. You know, it's kind mm -hmm. of deeply embedded within us. And, and I think the maps that you showed are so powerful at bringing a visibility uh, to the situation. And I guess this is a two-part question. One is just a question about everyday citizens, not people concerned with spatial environments. Um, this question around visibility, because you really talk about part of the petroleum scape that is sort of front stage and facing everyday citizens like the gas station versus the backstage elements of it, uh, which are really in the background and we can keep out of our mind the dirty reality of not just the environmental impact, but the, the labor and many of the other kind of issues that we know come around this. Um, there's both a question of bringing visibility to of these things, or, or I'm just curious to hear your thoughts about bringing visibility of the backstage to the public. Um, and then secondly, is there a role for legibility, which I would differentiate by not just seeing the stuff, but understanding how it works um, more. Um, so this is kind of one half of my question, which is much more about just everyday citizens. The other mm -hmm. half is around kind of questions about being oil, um, being naturalized within the city form or the city form naturalizing it is, you know, when and I, I'm asking this really as a, as a teacher and someone that has struggled with this with my own students in giving students um, projects to speculate on futures of different energy regimes or alternative ways we might relate to energy. Um, what are the things on the canvas 
already that need to be questioned. You know, so if we're, if we're giving students a scenario, is it within our same socio-political or economic systems, or is it completely divorced from those systems? Because those systems itself have already naturalized half of this equation. Like as we speculate moving forward, which elements can we kind of say, these are things that still ground us and are still valid are, are you know, let's say um, autonomous from the naturalization of oil versus things that, you know, as a discipline, you know, using concrete or steel, you know, there's so many aspects for material selection, but also just questions about like, what are the rules of these futures that are being created? And I'm curious what kind of um, canvas you give to students, like what types of realities do they need to ground themselves in and which ones do you leave open-ended so that they can rethink things? That's at least five uh, complex Sorry. questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really a question around like how yeah. if, if we're like living within a false consciousness of the superstructure of oil and the petroleum scape and it's naturalized within city form, how do we bring visibility and legibility to it? And, and which elements of this do we need to really question as a discipline as first principles of how do we yeah. even move forward? Well, how do we bring visibility to it? So one, what I said in the beginning on putting on our oil glasses. So we've built a little, uh, it's no longer functional, but an, um, uh, uh, an, an augmented reality tool uh, where we had thousands of oil points in the area. And all of a sudden you find things like the petroleum wives of the Hague club as you look through the environment. So. In that sense, it was an idea to, through augmented reality, to highlight all the oil elements in your environment. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a role to bring up where oil is hiding and to do that for the regular citizen. And you could do, so the idea with that tool, I think I even have it in the presentation, I could even show it, but let's, um, uh, but the idea for that tool was also that everybody could share their own oil stories and often these oil stories will be positive ones uh, like in Germany where the the shops are closed Saturday at 12 or used to be and you don't have milk in the house where do you go to the gas station right so the gas station has has often had this this quality of your lifesaver Mm -hmm. And unless you be, so you need to, I think you, the, the, everybody needs to become aware of it. That's why I show you these toy gas stations and so on. Mm -hmm. And the tricky part, which is also what I tried to say with the humanities, we, we need to see it as we've been educated into it. And if you start just by saying, this is all bad, it is still be all bad, but we have to first accept this. We have good memories often associated with it. Mm -hmm. So that was this part where we thought about visualizing, getting the narratives, us accepting the narratives in some ways, and then rethinking those narratives. So for example, in Dunkirk, one of the students, after having done this Dunkirk study of oil, came up with oil steels, where oil stories were written into it and placed throughout the city so that you become aware Right now, people would say, oh, you worked, your father worked in the oil industry. Oh, that's bad. But there are so many, if you just block out these narratives, it's not going to help. So make them aware, make them part. And then, and I think that's where I said, uh, build on the existing, build on the existing material world in rewriting it. So rather than putting in green field refineries, let's see how we can use the areas that we have already polluted to depollute them, to rethink them, rather than just leaving all of these areas um, abandoned and starting all over. So that that was so just to be clear, that was the point I tried to make there. But I think the point for our students is that for me, architects are multipliers. So architects have much more impact on the built environment than the regular citizen. They will advise the regular citizens. They speak in the press. And to come back to our educational story, I think there should be an education just for architects as journalists, right? Which, for example, we can't do. Architects as, as, as activists. Um, so that, but that may give, give us more into the, into the education route. Uh, architects with a political conscience. So that you then can see how can we mine the cities that we have to take out the products we no longer want and reuse them. 
So that's mm -hmm. why I was going with my idea of um, reshaping what we already have. Take, mm -hmm. take responsibility what we have, not necessarily in continuing it, but mm -hmm. if, so another student came up with an algae generation site for the port of Dunkirk, right? This may all not be feasible at this point, but if we need these kinds of huge algae growing places, well, then maybe a port is the right dimension to do it in. And we already have it. We don't need to build another mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the, so that's, that, that was that part of you. That was more to your question. It was just, uh, uh, yeah. So the, 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 so in some ways you said it's, it's the city form is naturalizing oil. So then the question is how can we denaturalize oil and maybe not treat it as a waste product, but treat it as something that we can do something with. So pull it back out of these spaces and, and reuse it. And the other thing is um, what kind of canvas do we give students to think of? I think again, what we already have, it's written in it. So if American suburbia needs to be rethought then let's start in American suburbia and not build pedestrian talk towns two, meet, two, kilo, uh, two hours drive away from Washington, et cetera, to then build a walkable cities. I mean, even new urbanists have turned to existing towns to revitalize and rethink them. But so that start with what we have, the system we have, analyze it critically, and from there try to go to where you want to be. I don't know, but that's what I was, to. Yeah, no, I think it's really smart. I, I you know, I wonder, um, and this isn't a question you have to answer is if we can see where we want to be. You know, I think we can see maybe the end goal, but I, I don't know if we can see the types of things we hold on to in our world today and the types of things that we need to reevaluate and how deeply intertwined these things are to, to pull them apart to make those uh, transitions forward. Uh, which brings me to kind of just questions around uh, power, you know, when we talk about the oil industry. And I think this is one of the things I always struggle with when we talk about climate change is the burden we all feel as individuals and how little we sometimes feel that we have when we speak to these types of questions because we're so deeply entangled uh, within uh, these regimes. And, um, and I'm thinking of a book, some of you might know this book that was put out maybe 10 years ago called Ecological Urbanism uh, through the GSD, which, um, you know, was a book that as I read it, I became more confused about what ecological urbanism was, the further I went through the book. Um, but I felt that there was always a question in the book that was missing, um, or maybe the elephant in the room was questions around uh, centralization of power when we try to think about cities as forms of um, artificial ecologies to really have forms of deep systemic integration, uh, feedback mechanisms working in transcalar ways. You know, we're talking about things that have some level of integration that are often required through or only kind of pull through through a kind of centralized way of thinking about urbanism, which seems very at odds with um, liberal democracies, obviously, and, and how we might build cities in, in liberal democracies. And so I, I guess I'm curious because oil has such a deep history with questions around company towns. And uh, there's been a lot of like experiments where there was like whole cities built through essentially a singular um, entity. And obviously many of those were failed cities. Um, but one of the kind of powerful ideas around that is that by building a form of urbanism through a centralized entity, you can have forms of deep systemic integration uh, of parts. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm curious just about these kind of questions around power. You know, I don't know if uh, the power is good or bad, but questions about how do we wield power to think about um, questions around systemic integration that might be required for more resilient um, forms of urbanism? Yeah, another really tricky question. Um, the very first image I showed you of the Schuylkill River showed also a number of sailing ships. And the lightning destroyed six Exxon Standard Oil ships at the time. Mm. The company already was big enough that it, it didn't have insurance. 
but it had such a large um, upstream, downstream um, financial flow that it could just weather this loss. So I think what I'm trying to say here is that these, these flows are so global and that's also a question of power. Mm -hmm. How can we even get out of it? And so this whole planetary urbanization again, if you can, um, you could turn Europe green, but that doesn't change the world. So one part of, if I had my augmented reality tool in, as I would have liked it to be, I would have been able to see in the refineries of Rotterdam, now it's oil from Kuwait, now it's oil from Nigeria, where I'm actually sourcing this from. What are the wheels of commodity flows and how can we, particularly the maritime flows, how can we tax them in a fair way so that the, 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 um, the, the environmental um, pollution doesn't just end in the ocean and nobody taxes the shipping industry. So these kinds of things that are part of facilitating these, these global exchanges. Now, the question I think that you are also asking is would decentralization actually help um, is, is also a tricky one, I think. So could you, could specific parts just withdraw like Bhutan or whatever? Um, and how do we how do we make that feasible uh, in in the built environment? So this, yeah, if I mean, and that's also the trickiness of say everybody has their own solar panels and their windmills on the roof uh, mm -hmm. or their geothermal plants, but we still depend on the, uh, the 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 bigger public infrastructures that deliver the the electricity from one place to the other. Mm -hmm. So this this interplay between the I think what you're asking also is an interplay between the public and the private, with the public always being limited to a national scale, and then the the power of the oil industries really surrounding the world and not having a counterbalance. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we could just even if everybody had their own solar panels, we still need the schools and we still need to travel and we still need public infrastructures to to work. So. Maybe it's a plea for more planning, more mm -hmm. public planning that is in the that is that has a benefit for the populations attached to it. And, and there it goes back to this question: is it all post-colonial or neo-colonial mm -hmm. in some ways, as long as the populations here live on the benefit of uh, oil being drilled in Nigeria, or even if you turn it around and it's solar panels built from materials um, from other parts of the world. I'm not sure that this is going where you wanted it to go. No, no, I think it's a really interesting point because, you know, if, if one thing COVID has taught us is, is really questions about, you know, if you think of COVID as some sort of worldwide experiment in governance and uh, centralized versus distributed power, we can see how different countries have fared uh, with this. And in fact, some of the countries that have um, done best, if we just think about like death, you know, as a matrix, um, have been countries that have had very centralized power regimes and uh, very uh, strong restrictions. Um, and, you know, so this is kind of where I'm coming at with this kind of question about centralizing mm -hmm. power versus distributing power in its effectiveness. Uh, because on one hand, I feel like there's, um, you're drawing a narrative where the average person is so deeply intertwined with the petroleum scape that we can't see our way out of it. You know, we don't even, mm. we can't even see it, right? So on one hand, you know, there's a question of how do you consult a population like this, i.e. all of us, mm -hmm. uh, because our own framework for understanding our relationship to this is not so clear. So I, I think this kind of gets into the colonial, post-colonial kind of conversation yeah, I mean, here. Uh, is I, how I, do we would, engage uh, that? I would perhaps add to this, you know, the, 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 the question of narrative, right? And how, how to say, so how complex is the actual narrative or how to pin the right story <laughs> to say mm -hmm. so I like very much right. how you kind of create a public how uh, you, how, exactly how you explain that architect could be a journalist right or architect mm -hmm. could develop political consciousness in order to enter into basically into the the kind of public arena to negotiate the narrative no mm -hmm. so I I'm curious to ask you um you know of obviously fossil fuels have been linked to the greenhouse gas emissions, right? So this is, 
in my mind, this is the narrative <laughs> that that is currently out there around, um, you know, the kind of pathway to, uh, you know, reduction of emissions, sustainability, you know, weaning of fossil fuels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, no. You haven't you haven't mentioned it, and I I think I find it very powerful how you you go through this kind of deep layers and and really perhaps uh, also reveal that there is a kind of a, a certain nakedness or that, that the story of CO two emissions is rather uh, rather uh, um, weak you know as a as a as a let's say a narrative that can mobilize change right but on the other hand. What is happening is that you know CO two has become a kind of a tool in the hands of government uh, uh, and also academia. It's become a kind of a measurable goal, right? Mm -hmm. And I am I am wondering. So it it does it does uh, let's say mobilize a certain kind of a uh, a wider wider front or it seems to and it links to the kind of problem of, of you know climate change uh, uh, and so on so so where where do you think we should be going in terms of uh, constructing or or you know unearthing the right narratives no I mean how, how do you feel about co2 or where where would you personally want to push that <laughs> the kind of a co2 perspective no? Or, or the greenhouse gas perspective? I think it's probably too limited, quite frankly. Um, it's, it's important, but there are other gases. And that's why the plastic story is so important. It's way more complex than CO2. I mean, CO2 is the part of the burning the fuel, but when you get a barrel of oil out of the ground, let's say we, we still need it for plastics. Let's assume if we wanted that, or we need it for medical goods. Still, we would be getting a barrel of oil out of the ground and use 7% or whatever is for plastics. What do we do with the rest? Do we dump it back into the ground? We probably won't. So as long as we need some part of the petroleum, we, will, we either have to reinvent something to do with the other parts of it, or we have to um, solve the petrol the, the plastics question because otherwise you always have a reason to get petroleum out of the ground hmm. so that's why I think the that's why I'm saying I think the the petrol that the petroleum question is a much bigger question than just the co2 question mm -hmm. and if we address only that part we don't solve the problem because we still will get the the oil out of the ground I think that's that's exactly why um, when, when you ask me about the narratives, and so that's the, the other part of the story, Hollywood films about oil, plenty. Uh, advertisements really celebrating oil. And the when you start looking into advertisements by the oil company, they're really cutting edge most of the time. So they pick up issues of gender and environment right away. Why isn't the uh, green energy transition having as big an impact why don't we see all the green uh, where are the so my, my students made a, a picture of a couple uh, having their wedding in front of a heritage refinery i mean people have a wedding in front of a windmill traditional windmill that's a dutch engineering device but who is having their wedding picture taking in front of a modern windmill right so we are not we're still thinking of it, it's purely technology. And the bigger narrative of its whole being part of our everyday life is not told sufficiently. That's why, that's why I like this milkmaid turning into the oil maid approach. So if we really want to reach the citizens, I think we have to start by saying, here's your basketball, how much oil is in it? Here is and, and Charlotte, we were, you were telling me about your students looking into materials. A group of my students made a little video, animated video clip, how much oil is in, how, in, in, in wood. So many architects are now going to build with wood. And so they had calculated cutting the wood with a petroleum fueled chainsaw. 
trucking the wood from the forest to the city, uh, putting the wood into the machines that will saw it up, trucking it to the building site. And all of a sudden, even a piece of wood, which seems a natural material, is extremely petroleum intensive. So, I mean, the, the, getting into the depth, I'm not saying I have mm -hmm. the solution of how yeah. to solve it, but getting into the depth of these processes. And so they went into how much oil is in glass, how much oil is in, and all of a sudden you see that all of these seemingly, uh, well, even natural building materials are really driving the whole petroleum system. And so that's that's why I'm think I'm hoping for narratives that are even more extensive than, and CO2 is important, obviously, and there's no doubt about it, but you don't see the exact, where it lands exactly, who is harmed? How does this impact your, your health concretely for the people living in this neighborhood? How much does come out of that ship and gets to that? I mean, you, you would have made, have to make this narrative even more tangible to, yeah, to reach the, people. Those were the kind of necropolitics that, that, that I was uh, discuss, uh, mentioning earlier. Uh, I think this discussion on narrative is so interesting because for me, it's related also to questions of politics and, and the power that Niraj was also mentioning. Um, I think it's very interesting to see how, for instance, the French government really, uh, you know, in French you say take take its foot in the carpet, c'est pris les pieds dans le tapis with this uh, tax on, uh, you know, uh, green tax for the everyday, you know, for the for the lay people, and that led to basically a complete uprising and uh, you know upturn the nation with the gilets jaunes movement, which people where people. Are, are fully aware that this is a complete uh, fallacy, the sense that the government has, you know, perhaps a kind of, you know, a, let's say a superficial interest in uh, pushing green agendas because it make it look, uh, you know, progressive, but in reality uh, doesn't actually understand the hardship, hardship of people. Uh, you know, the fact that uh, you will um, tax cars, um, but on the other hand, deconstruct the entire public system infrastructure where you, which would allow people to not, not take their cars, for instance, uh, also speaks of uh, the kind of hypocrisy that uh, politics uh, and politicians in general, let's say governments, even centralist uh, governments like the French government, which is, you know, highly um, centralist in this case, uh, uh, are, are basically uh, imposing on our lives and on, on all of us. And uh, the question, so that is, the, for me, it's not, it's really not a, something I don't have an answer because I think it's clear that you can't uh, rely on citizens to kind of, I mean, you can to a certain extent, but we all know the limits of, you know, being vegetarian in the face of planetary destruction uh, and, you know, uh, having uh, governments taxing the citizens for taking their cars while at the same time depriving them or of the kind of public services that would help them not to do that. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious when you talked about the, the fact that demands has been fueled also, and no pun intended really, uh, in, 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 uh, by architects also in, in some ways, no, you were having these slides where you see, um, I wonder if there is also a possibility to deconstruct that. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the, the difficulty of that with the example of wood, but, uh, but I, I find this almost like a mission. You know, when we, when we uh, look at the ways that we um, design and when we look at the way that, that our <clears throat> buildings are produced or made or fabricated, manufactured, uh, I think that somehow the, the urgency would be really to point at, as you were saying, the, the harm done that people know, but at the same time, uh, put these governments in front of their responsibilities and not, you know, uh, sell us this kind of fake, uh, I cannot hear the word sustainable anymore, personally, I, I really, I, I almost get a rash because it kind of, um, it's so, it's such a hypocrisy at that point that um, I feel like that, like, there's a real urgency to address these questions, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a, Almost a, a kind of revolt manner. So I'm 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 asking you if you if you if you see this kind of possibility of deconstructing the narratives on the one hand, as Milica was saying, uh, you know, are you are you in conversation, for instance, yourself with uh, as an educator, a, a historian, a researcher, uh, an architect? Uh, are you are you able to see the kind of possible way? Uh, that that we have ahead in that sense. I mean, I know that's that's an impossible question, but 
if you could I mean, maybe I think, yeah. look there's into There's probably, that. sorry, nobody in, in an individual, but we have some powerful institutions here on the screen, right? If we had an alliance of ETH, MIT, uh, whatever, Delft, et cetera, if we brought this up in our curriculum in a, in a, in a, in a shared way, I think that could actually make students think. And once we get the students to think, that's why I'm saying the architects are multipliers. If we could get more and more students to actually question also, and, and Neeraj, I'm throwing this back to you, but also what the design professors said, that they're not just told put another solar panel, but that they are actually asking them to think more deeply on what this means and for who does it mean and what does it imply and maybe ask the different difficult questions. Okay, you can't have uh, uh, more square meters and at the same time be sustainable. So how do we solve this? So, mm -hmm. so I think this is sometimes this, at least in my environment, but with the technology dependence does often not allow us to think in these lifestyle, lifestyle change that we actually would need to make it happen. And I mean, that's why I find this history of the petroleum revolution so powerful, because when petroleum started, you had within weeks, you had towns of 10,000 men and a handful of women coming up somewhere, popping up in, in Western Pennsylvania. So where are those, where, where is the, the, the green energy of that, same, of that same scale compared to contemporary living? So why is it not taken off? Why don't we have the designer and the, uh, well, everybody, deeply engaged in finding those those ways other than just through technology. I don't have the solution. I just mm -hmm. think education can be one way of bringing it on. And also in some ways you said just what can our nations do? I mean, there's a lot of elections. How can we get to those decision makers? I mean, about yeah. the alliance, we already have one, no? Milita and, and you know, so we have the ETH uh, GSD <laughs> alliance uh, in the making somehow and, and possibly, I don't know, like uh, yes. trying to, to kind of really yes. make a case for that. So let's, there is a hope. Yeah, and I, I mean, we, we have here California College of the yes. Arts. Where it's, a, it's really kind of a fabulous. Uh, yeah, uh, I would love to teach a studio with any of you. So I have an open uh, offer. But yes. I, I really just want to say, I, I really appreciate you taking this conversation out of a technological one into a yeah. cultural conversation yeah, about absolutely. how do we rethink yeah, the city and its narratives and um, th the one thing I struggle with personally with students and kind of questions around climate change is we know it's a cultural issue at its core and only technology and other things will follow uh, but I also know culture takes a long time to change it's, it's a very slow process to change culture and uh, and then when you read scientific papers about uh, the urgency and the timelines that climate change has right now versus kind of cultural uh, shifts. Um, I wonder how we construct narratives that uh, incite an urgency that might be different from the guilt-driven narratives of, that we have currently around climate change. Yeah, and maybe it would be a way, I mean, I'm fascinated by this idea to say, do a shared studio bring together different student cultures and let it be uh, observed and accompanied by cultural uh, people from the social sciences and the culture. So mm -hmm. to, to, to activate the power of student groups from different universities in different settings to actually make, generate change ideally. Looks like we have a solution to our oil crisis. <laughs> oh, it, sounds, it, sounds, it sounds very, very powerful because uh, I think the, the the question or or perhaps the kind of a uh, you know studio as an intervention in a, in a, in a public discourse, right? So I'm I'm very very attracted. Uh, uh, to your idea that architects should be educated as journalists. I mean, I, I, I know that, uh, you know, Rem Kolhas somehow, he, he became the kind of prototype because he was also a journalist. And so, so this is through him, the, the kind of a notion of a journalist, but uh, uh, came into architecture, but, uh, or, or kind of more strongly, but let's say the idea that architect is somebody who can investigate and produce a kind of investigative journalism around uh, material cultures, around spatial practices, you know, that then 
can really to say so <laughs> end up on the on the pages of the of the you know daily news or in the social media i think it's uh, it's very powerful because i think that in fact in in uh, in our day and age we this is in fact the most powerful um medium through which we shift opinions right i mean media the news media is is way more powerful than education today right so i think that this uh, this way to say so of in uh, infiltrating the kind of cultural sphere through you know through the news media is is very appealing to me but like how, how to how to really um uh you know how, how to really let's say get to that stage it's i i uh, i find it find it also very, very, very interesting, right? And um, um, I, uh, I think, uh, I think it would be would be great, because we have, uh, we have, we have uh, some uh, brilliant people still with us in the audience, and, and also your collaborators, the, the time, the clock is, is, uh, <laughs> is quite, yes, I, I typed, uh, quite also far, if, but it would want be great to just type questions also that's okay yeah, we should we should have a few questions i'm not sure if we have some in the chat or or should we if if, uh, uh, if you have a question please um raise your hands or unmute yourself that's also possible yeah and and, and julia maybe you have some thoughts too Julia, calling out is 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 totally <laughs> forbidden in uh, in Disney. I try not to do that. Can't refuse but... <laughs> right now, Julia. Julia, if Apologies. you have any, <laughs> no, she oh. has a, she has an excellent article in the back of her head, so that's <laughs> no, no worries. I'm happy to, I mean, to intervene, but uh, I don't have a specific question. I'm really fascinated by the way you are approaching all this. And and yeah, as, as you know, I'm, I'm, it, this is something I'm struggling with because I'm also working on, on the history of the petroleum scape, but I'm also trying to be a practitioner myself and doing projects which can change things, as you said, hopefully, at least mentality, at least the way we look at things in space. So nothing, I can just say that I was really happy to listen to the conversation. But Julia, thank you so much. I just want to pick up on something you said about um, the kind of uh, uh, idea that we, we, so not only as architect, but also as educator, educator, we have to face this. And, and it, it relates a little bit to this question of, you know, if we were to do a joint studio, it also speaks about the responsibility of uh, our institutions. I mean, I wonder how come none of our institution, I mean, I don't, I, not that I'm aware of, but hasn't called for, uh, climate emergency, for instance, like if we were to really sit and, and kind of ask about certain responsibilities, if we were to really, um, I don't know, uh, take this question serious, how come that these kinds of uh, strong signals have not been yet embraced by educational institutions when some municipalities have already done that? I think London has. Um, so I know that it's just a gimmick. You could almost say it's like a, it's, it's like this sustainable taxes or whatever those things are but at the same time it would probably allow to um, to do this kind of joint curriculums to really uh, embrace these questions of uh, extractivist practice in relation to the built environment and how we need perhaps uh, architecture to pivot as a as a practice right so I, I think that for me I would throw back these questions to um to the to the institutions themselves and how they actually deal with it yeah yeah i think we we are uh, each one is sitting at a very powerful uh, institution so i think and and students uh, are there with us and uh, and uh, and many interesting guests today so uh, so we'll we'll have to address it at our institutions i think that our our uh, i mean Thinking about this, you know, during this conversation, I have to say, um, I have, I have, uh, I give you a little, little illustration. I have just seen a um, uh, um, poster on the street, so uh, that uh, uh, basically re reveals the the Swiss uh, discussion around 
uh, the the use of oil in heating, right? So so one of the one of the kind of discoveries about Switzerland that I made uh, living here is that this entire country is powered on, by oil, right? In terms of in terms of uh, heating homes, right? And this this transition is going on, but uh, now there is a, um, a, a CO2 gazettes being uh, prepared, and there will be a public vote and. Uh, in all likelihood, people will refuse because this uh, 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 vote would lead to, to higher prices of heating oil, right? So it's a, it's a very pragmatic, so in a way, it's not even about the kind of sentimental, <laughs> to say so, attachments to, you know, oil, you know, spaces, infrastructures, Lego toys, etc. I mean, it's even, to say so, the, the, the costs, no? That are uh, that are that are driving the debate. So in a way, uh, um, um, I, uh, I I I find the the kind of a, the the entire pragmatism of that discussion is 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 almost uh, disarming, right? <laughs> like I mean, how, how could we possibly you know argue against you know the price of heating oil, right? So so you know if we want to talk about you know i don't know the value of nature or you know the, the climate or you know ec ecological um, uh, ramifications etc cetera, etc cetera, all, all of that all of that um, all those arguments uh, are are uh, are uh, 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 let's say rather problematic so i I, uh, uh, I I deeply agree, you know, that that uh, that a kind of a, a change of uh, change of narrative is is due, but uh, uh, and it's really a let's say an important question that you that you opened for us, Carola, because uh, the complexity is uh, is really kind of uh, interesting, and I think that uh, that. Uh, um, we are beginning as architects, I think, through through our research. Uh, you know, we've discussed uh, the visibility, we discussed uh, legibility, you know, and this kind of a, a complexity of these petroleum scapes is 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 you know. I really appreciate that you that you bring it to to view. And uh, but I would say it's it's I find it fascinating that we have as profession taken this task right of of kind of understanding this type of spaces and places right so I think we are we are getting there or kind of getting the skills to be able to actually kind of explain them and narrate them and so on so I, this is what they what they personally uh, find uh, exciting. So, uh, so I hope uh, I hope uh, we'll be will be able to. And I, I see that we have two two questions. Uh, Anna Maria asks us: uh, Couldn't architecture be the pr profession to sensitize toward the cultural importance of nature? You know, this uh, against the kind of techno technological solutions, techno fixes. Um, let's say dependence on on. Uh, uh, various types of technologies and infrastructures, and I see that Nitin also is there with the question. Would you would you like to actually uh, say it, Nitin? Because uh, I I think it's it's uh, perhaps you will be able to explain it better. Uh, let's see. I don't know if the internet is stable enough to ask that question. Um, I'm sort of calling from home and it's dropping quite often. But uh, yeah, I mean, Carola, I had seen your presentation at the AAG when you just presented this paper at Washington, uh, in Washington, and it was super fascinating. And I came today to uh, have a second look and sort of like more in depth look um, at, at this work. It was uh, super interesting to think through um, a chapter I just finished writing on uh, India's hybrid revolution. And uh, I'm looking at this sort of uh, new pace of construction of 30 kilometers of greenfield highway. And I was thinking about like kind of this uh, center periphery relationships again, sort of like um, uh, surfacing. Uh, so I, I had like two questions. One is um, I was really interested in the um, um, reference you put for the asphalt uh, with the Kingford way. Uh, I, I was, I wanted to see if you had like um, um, sort of uh, was it conjectural or was it sort of like based in archival evidence? Because if it's based in archival evidence, it would really help me. Um, and the second one was perhaps I was picking up 
on Eric uh, Swingedow's uh, sort of critique of object-oriented ontologies, uh, which sort of pick up on like words like oilscapes or like you know just this uh, a, a sort of like object and try to sort of um, I mean, I'm not I'm not sort of critiquing in this way. I, I I see that you know it's it's sort of like very sophisticated work which goes in all directions, but uh, there's this critique of uh, the whole sort of like sustainability and green transition uh, theories in sort of urban political ecology, uh, because um, it's sort of like based in object-oriented ideas, which sort of depoliticize, tend to depoliticize and sort of also see them in um, uh, local uh, local metabolisms. So I, I, was, I was sort of like um, curious, like how would you, uh, um, sort of, uh, I asked this because you start in your paper by quoting um, um, Apudurai uh, scapes and then using all scapes um, as like sort of a, a a space where the center periphery relationship doesn't exist anymore. So I, I was sort of like, um, I, I got curious to to sort of think through Swingado and how would you sort of address that. Uh, I mean, it's it, again, it's a huge question. It's a really important one. And, and we can continue discussing also separately um, via email. I've put my email in the chat. The, I, I mean, the, let me start with this question on center periphery, because I wonder, and this is not, this is off the top of my head, but in some ways it is rewritten a oil company can escape in war times from The Hague to Curaçao, uh, and the national government can't shift as easily, but the oil companies still need a foot on the ground. So they do depend on some relations, but they can play nations against each other. And these oil companies are often bigger than some of the, say, states in Scandinavia or so. So it, it's a, it's, maybe we have to rethink also our concept of, uh, center periphery because where is what is the center what is the periphery how does it change between russian chinese etc oil companies but that doesn't answer your question on the, the petroleum scape and i'm calling it petroleum scape and not oil scape also for archival reasons because if you search for oil you get all kinds of oil but you don't necessarily get petroleum the fact that I'm looking at petroleum, and yes, it's only one product, and you could do the same thing for other products. A student of mine is looking at coffee and commodity flows, and you could apply similar concepts or at wheat, and it changes over time. So it's much more about exemplifying it through one lens. The way that I came to it was not through theory, but it was through working on all kinds of spaces, and each time oil popped up. And that's where this idea of the spatial reality and spatial power of oil came from. So I was looking at a business district in Hamburg and the architecture competitions for the buildings therein, and three of them were for Shell, Esso, and BP, right? Because they were the first one to be able to, they were so big, they had to move out of the inner cities. They started to create new business districts. And you see the same thing in, in Milan and in Paris, as well as in Hamburg. So you, you, that was my first piece. Then I looked at Maurice Rotival, an urbanist who traveled the world thanks to the flows of oil because he met Rockefeller and Harrison in Venezuela and then was hired in New Haven and, and taught at Yale and went back to Europe. So each somehow each article I wrote or each topic I took on as different as it seemed from oil in the end was tied to oil. And even my port cities, here I was looking at port cities, having been from port cities, and what happens, it's all about oil again. And that's what got me to this oil dimension. So yes, it's only one flux, but it's, I, so for me, it's much more about pointing out how we could use that lens to understand space. And I think that's important for me, a lot of economic geographers also in the port, port city world, they make beautiful maps and they show the power of visualization, but they don't think about the exact spaces where it lands. And maybe then my next plea can also link to the answer to the prior question. Because I think we have in, in the Dutch, the Dutch say alpha, beta and gamma sciences. And so it's a, 
humanity, social sciences, technology, but where are the spatial sciences? So in some way, I think we actually have to first create that field of spatial sciences. We don't have uh, research agencies where we can apply for as spatial scientists. So we are always between all of these fields of application. So we either have to put on a tab as a hat as a technologist or as a social scientist. In many of these drop down menus, we are not even findable. So that I think was much more my goal and making clear that it's about space. And that in some ways answers also your question about nature or culture. And it's interesting because we just had that discussion in, in class last week. So what's nature? And Jane Amidon has written a really nice article on that. But the, the, the point is, if we extract humans from nature, then we're almost putting ourselves at a godlike level. So maybe, I forget someone mentioned the word ecos ecosystem before, but if we could put ourselves back into that connection, then you also find the, the Great Barrier Reef and natural heritage sites reconnected through planetary urbanization to cultural elements. So that would be kind of my, my answer or brief answer to, to, to Anna Maria's question. So rather than disconnecting nature and culture, what happens in institutions like UNESCO and so on, how can we make sure or make clear and, and tell that these are actually integrated? At least that's what I would argue. And so in that sense, yes, yes. couldn't architecture be the profession to sensitize towards the cultural importance of nature is an interesting one. So could architecture help us reconnect nature and culture could be another way to turn it. I, I would argue that there is a shift currently, let's say, in, in uh, I mean, I, having spent an entire dissertation on the role of, uh, you know, commodities on the, on the built environment, I, I would say, I think that there is a, there is a kind of pivoting towards, maybe not upfront, you know, in the sense of nature, but at least uh, in a kind of repositioning of architecture as a, as a profession that, that is legitimate to look at this, um, to look at this political economy. Of, of materials, but also of commodities and, and, and larger questions. So um, I, th I think uh, we would probably um, close at, uh, at that. I think that uh, we, we've reached uh, quite far in our conversation. We even found a way to solve the oil crisis with a joint studio. So that's really a, uh, <laughs> that's really a great way to, to, <laughs> to conclude our, our yeah. talk. It's, it's something we should uh, we should really uh, we should really discuss in the you know ra rather soon yes would be great and uh, and yes go on Carol yeah, given that we that we no sorry given that we are with ETH and Munich and so on we also have our internal network and with MIT we have a network so I think this we should activate those. Yeah, Sorry. that would be that would be uh, that would be sensational. I I don't I'm not aware that this kind of a you know pun uh, <laughs> let's say planetary studio was ever attempted. And <laughs> definitely something to 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 give it a, give it a try. And uh, I think this uh, also this somehow strangely enough this pandemic experience also you know catalyze this uh, you know possibility let's say of these of these long distance conversations which is what we what we just uh, enjoyed uh this uh, this afternoon so uh, so i uh, i really would would thank you warmly uh, carola in in delft uh, and uh, in in san francisco a fabulous city um, we didn't speak about the connections of San Francisco to, <laughs> let's say, oil business, but that would be interesting as well. So uh, it's fantastic to, it's really great pleasure that, that, that we could do this session. Thank you so much for, for joining and for, for uh, uh, having this uh, uh, fantastic, um, uh, sharing these fantastic ideas and, and conversations.